Oh, yes, we are starting streaming. Go. Awesome. All right. Hello and welcome. Um, I want to take the time today to introduce Reka uh, Nair, Immigration Justice in Arizona. Uh, Reka is a first generation immigrant who grew up in Mesa, Arizona. She is a proud graduate of ASU and Penn Law. She is currently the plan lead attorney for the Florida Florence Immigrant and Refugee Rights Protection, where she provides quality free legal services to low income non detained immigrants in Maricopa County and or with cases before Phoenix Immigration Court. She previously worked as an assistant federal public defender in the District of Arizona as managing attorney for the Florence Project Adult Detention Team and as deputy law clerk in the Honorable Magistrate Judge Louis Bloom in the U.S. District Court of Eastern District of New York. Please welcome me and a huge HSGP welcome for Ray Kinnear. Thank you. Um, oh yeah, there we go. Uh, but if people have other questions about, for instance, like ice rays, which are maybe happening right now or happening today, I'm happy to answer that. But that's internal enforcement, and that's not really included in my presentation, but I do a lot of work with that, and I'm happy to answer those questions as well. But before I jump into that, um, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about me and um, the organizations that I work with. And the reason I do that is one, it's a little bit of propaganda opportunity for me to support the organizations that I work with. And also I think in an age where we have a lot of fake news, it's important for you to be able to judge my credibility and to know um, what experience I have and why I'm here today um, talking about these topics. So I work with the Florence Immigrant and Refugee Rights Project, more commonly known as the Florence Project. It's a nonprofit here in Arizona that provides free legal services to men, women, and children detained in immigration custody in Arizona. Um, so do folks know where people are detained here in immigration custody? Anyone have any ideas? Yeah, so great. Florence, that's where the Florence Project name comes from, was the first place they started um, holding uh, people in immigration detention. Uh, right now in Florence, there are two facilities, the Florence Detention Center, which holds about 400 folks, and then there is uh, Florence Correctional Center, also known as Central Arizona Detention Center, um, which is actually a, a jail and a prison, um, but has immigration detainees held there as well. Um, I think those numbers are now around um, 500. Anyone else know where else um, immigrants are detained? Yuma. Yuma, okay, so great. Yuma, folks in Yuma who are detained are often detained um, in a criminal process um, because they have maybe unlawfully entered the country and they are being charged with illegal entry or illegal re-entry. Usually that Yuma uh, facility is for more short-term people who go through the Operation Streamline process, which is this mass criminal process by which people are prosecuted for entering the country unlawfully. Uh, but usually after Yuma, they are either deported or they are then transferred to a uh, longer-term ICE detention facility. Uh, great, anywhere else? What's up? Douglas. I'm not sure if there are immigration detention facilities in Douglas. If they are, they're just right at the border with CBP. There are sort of these um, shorter term holding cells, which we're going to talk about a little bit more. I heard someone say Eloy. Yeah. Eloy is huge. It is the largest place where we detain um, immigrant adults. So there are two places in Eloy now. The first is the Eloy Detention Center, um, which houses, has the capacity for about 1,500 immigrants. And it's the only place in Arizona where women are detained. Then basically right next door to Eloy, there's a place called La Palma Correctional Center. Um, it used to also be a prison and is now being fully converted to house um, folks in immigration custody. And right now they have about 1,000 beds and they're thinking it might open up to 1,500 and maybe even more. And they're only uh, men detained there as well. 
So great, we've covered like all the main places adults are kept. What about kids? Where are kids being detained? They are being detained in cages, um, particularly at the border, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more. But once they get past the border stage, kids are detained in so-called shelters that are here in Phoenix uh, and in Tucson. And we have about, it varies a lot, the kids' numbers, but um, I think capacity for about 1,000 kids between Tucson and Phoenix or in the surrounding areas. Um, and they're in a bunch of different shelters. I think there's something like 13 or 15 here in the Phoenix area. Yes? Before we continue, would you please define or differentiate illegal and unlawful use um, I think it means the same thing right. for me. Um, I do not refer to immigrants as illegal. I feel like that is a derogatory term, but people's actions can be illegal or their entry can be unlawful. Um, and usually when I refer to immigrants, I will either call them immigrants, undocumented immigrants, or in this case, we'll be talking a lot about asylum seekers. And that's just because I think words matter um, and I don't choose to use those um, other words. Thank you. Thank you. And your name is Barry? I am Barry. Barry, so perfect example. Feel free throughout this presentation to just raise your hand. You're not gonna really distract me. Um, I am happy to answer questions as they come up. So great, so that's a little bit about the Florence Project. Um, and I wanna kind of talk about why legal representation matters because that's the main thing the Florence Project provides. Um, as you guys may know, in immigration court, there is no right uh, to a free attorney. There's no public defender system there. That system is only in criminal court. All civil legal matters, as they call them, do not have a right uh, to an attorney, maybe with one exception of when your parental rights are being terminated. And this is really crazy because some judges have talked about how this is the equivalent of having a death penalty case in a traffic court setting. You have very few protections in immigration court, one of which is no right to an attorney. Um, the Florence Project really believes and the statistics show that legal representation um, matters. In immigration court, for folks who are detained, 86% do not have an attorney, 86% of adults um, and one that is because they as individuals um, and as families don't have money to pay for an attorney and then the other issue is that they put detention centers in faraway places right Florence Eloy Yuma there are huge illegal populations in these areas and attorneys from Phoenix or Tucson who are representing folks have to include in their costs driving all the way there driving all the way back and putting detention centers in faraway places is causing a real la um, problem for access to counsel um, and then the other real issue about why legal representation matters is because in immigration court, everything, unsurprisingly, is in English. And you have a right to have an interpreter at the court hearing. So anything you say, anything the judge says, anything the ICE attorney says is being interpreted to you there in the hearing. But every single document you receive is in English. And you have no right to have any of those documents interpreted for you no matter what language you speak, no matter what level of education you have. Um, and so that's a real problem and another really big way and a really important reason why folks need counsel. Um, the statistics show, um, and this is from American Immigration Council, that you're four times more likely to get out of detention on bond or other conditions so you can continue your case if you have an attorney, four times more likely. And they're also two times more likely to win in detention uh, if you have an attorney. Um, and so this is a really big push, um, an important piece of what the Florence Project provides. And they do that both locally by providing direct representation, meaning our staff attorneys represent people in immigration court proceedings, and by pro bono placement, meaning we find other attorneys in the community to take on these cases with mentorship from the Florence Project. We also provide integrated social services. So we know that our clients are not just facing a battle in the immigration court system, but they often have a host of other needs, whether it be mental health, they might have children who are in DCS custody because they've been detained, um, they might be survivors of trauma and they need other support and assistance. And we are so lucky that right now we have, I think, six social workers on staff. It is not enough, but it is very rare actually to have that kind of collaborative um, system and it makes a huge difference for our clients um, and the advocacy that we can provide them to be able to provide them with that support. We also do and pioneered a model of called pro se empowerment. Right now, adults detained in Arizona is approximately 4,000 adults on any given day. Um, we do not have the capacity to represent every single one of them. And so what we try to do for the rest is provide them with know your rights training and then what's called pro se assistance, which means that pro se means you're going forward without an attorney. Um, and we help prep you so that you can be the best advocate you can possibly be for yourself. 
And in certain cases, you can really win on your own. Um, you have the same rights, and with proper preparation, you can win. Um, some cases, of course, are easier to win than others without an attorney. And then the last piece is that we also do a lot of national advocacy efforts um, from writing what are called amicus briefs, which are briefs that you might submit from third parties in a Supreme Court case or something like that to explain the position of practitioners on the ground to um, lobbying at state and uh, local, local, state and national levels um, as part of a coalition for changes in laws or to try to block laws as appropriate. Yes, okay. Yes, so Kate asks, have you had any experiences where CBP is denying you access even where you're directly representing? So I have two comments on that. One, CBP is really only at the border, and we're gonna talk about the different agencies in a minute. The Florence Project generally, with one exception of one partnership, which I will mention in a minute, is not at the border. When we are seeing people, they were already in detention in ICE custody. One of the things that we are very lucky to have is, uh, I don't know if good is the right word, but it's a good and transparent relationship with ICE that gives us access to these detention facilities and to anyone that we want to see there. I think, at least for us locally, we haven't had an issue with that. CBP is a different story. CBP means you're right at the border, and there have been some bad cases that have come out that says that individuals do not have a right to an attorney at the border. Not only do they not have a right, even if they are able to find an attorney who wants to come there, um, CBP does not necessarily have to allow you to speak to that attorney. All of this is still being litigated, um, but uh, there have been a lot of issues with that. But the Florence Project itself is usually not down there at that time. Um, great, so that leads me into some of the partnerships that the Florence Project has. One is with the Kino Border Initiative. They're in Nogales. They are a Jesuit organization. They do incredible work there running um, shelters and acomodor. Their work has really expanded um, because now what happens at the border is there's something called metering, um, which means it used to be that you come, you stop at the border, and you say, I want asylum. They're supposed to process you and let you into the United States, either into detention or to release you to go to a family member. But what's happening now is whether the backlog is real or created, they're doing metering, which means they're only letting in a certain number of people every day. And so what's resulting is that there's a huge line and you're waiting weeks and sometimes months to be even be able to process um, to access asylum. And so we have a partnership with KBI where we provide information to folks before they cross so that they know what they need to be expressing to make sure that they are able to exercise their right to asylum when they get to the border rather than just being turned around and deported. And then another partnership that the Florence Project has is with the Phoenix Legal Action Network or PLAN and I am the PLAN attorney. So the Florence Project, as I mentioned, really only works with detained adults and minors. But in January 2018, the Phoenix Legal Action Network um, with the Florence Project entered into a partnership to the f for the first time to provide free legal services to non-detained adults. And we did this because 63% uh, of non-detained individuals are also not represented. And in Phoenix, despite being one of the largest metropolitan areas in the country, has no free legal services provider for individuals in removal proceedings or immigration court proceedings. And we saw this to be a huge gap as compared to other cities and even as compared to Tucson, which has more services uh, for um, non-attained immigrants um, than we do. Um, so we created this partnership and this is where I work. Should any of you know anyone who needs assistance, you can go online and just fill out a questionnaire seeking assistance from us. Um, the folks that we serve in this particular project are all uh, below 200% of the poverty line. Um, they're caregivers, so they're parents to 47 U.S. citizen children. 32% are single parents. Oh, I thought I could just maybe click, but no. I'll click here. Um, and we also prioritize survivors of violence and trauma. So 20% are survivors of DV in the U.S., 22% outside, and 10% are survivors of torture. Um, we also prioritize other vulnerable populations. 12% of our clients are LGBTQ+. 22% are homeless or facing um, serious housing insecurity. 10% have diagnosed mental health conditions. And then 68% were previously detained, and 74% are in removal proceedings, which means literally they're in a court process where the government is trying to deport them. So we're really trying to prioritize folks who are at imminent risk of deportation. Oh, yay, 
Hey, thanks. Um, and so again, oh wow, I didn't know about that animation there. Um, but again, why legal representation matters so much is because they've shown in the non-detained context that representation can matter even more. And folks who are represented by attorneys are five times more likely to win their case. Um, and so that's why we created this project and that's why we're committed to moving it forward. Um, I have been doing this work um, on and off since 2014. I initially worked in the Florence Project adult detention team um, for two years, working in Florence and Eloy representing individuals and also um, putting forth our pro se empowerment model. And then I went to the federal public defenders and then I came back in January 2018 to launch this initiative for non-detained folks and I've been doing that um, ever since. Um, yes. Other word, non -detained. What does non -detained mean? Great. What do folks think? So what do we think non detained means? Correct. They're not in a facility. Oftentimes they are released to a family member, but that's not required. Sometimes it can be to other uh, folks. And it can include both people who are previously detained, right? They maybe came in, they were in detention, they've gotten out. That's 68%. Or it can include folks who have never been in detention whatsoever. And maybe ICE might not even know they're here, or ICE maybe stopped them, arrested them, and put them in an immigration court process, but decided not to detain them, because detention is not mandatory. Um, and so they could just be in a court process after having never been detained by ICE, except for those few couple hours to process them. Great question. All right, so moving on um, about Yes, in the back. That is a, oh, why do they detain some folks and not others? Sorry, I keep forgetting. Um, that is a great question. Um, where the answer, I don't know that I can fully answer that. Some, it seems very arbitrary. Uh, but one thing that I can tell you, usually if you have been um, picked up for a criminal offense, either an arrest or a conviction, you are most likely to be detained. And that's one area where the, it seems pretty clear that could be a reason. But we also find that men are detained more often than women. Um, we find that English speakers are less often detained than non-English speakers. Um, and so it is kind of arbitrary and whether or not, in some ways, if you can convince the individual who's arresting you um, to let you go or not. Um, and so women, especially women with children, are released far more often than even men who have children. Um, yes, in the back again. How do I count them? So I think your question is, how do we know how many people have never been detained? Is that right? Uh, yeah. OK, so at least for my statistics, these are literally my clients. So I have a list of clients. These statistics came from my clients that I had in 2018. Of all, I had like 70 some folks that we represent. And 68% had been in detention. The other percentage had never had been maybe stopped by ICE and were in the process or had never been stopped by ICE. So that's just based on my conversations with them and what they've disclosed. Um, we also do have estimates out there, right, of how many folks are undocumented uh, and maybe aren't in a court process. I don't know if the statistics are actually, sorry, delineated between folks who are in a process or who aren't, but that, um, I actually can't remember what that estimate is right now because there's been so much in the news about um, Trump saying that that estimate's way too low and he's alleging some like hundreds of millions of people. So I'm, I'm, I'm confused of X to, this, to the exact number right now and given all of that, I don't want to misstate uh, anything. Great. So um, now kind of more turning to the substance so I make sure we stay on track is about how to seek asylum and um, who has that right. So I hope everyone knows here but there is an international human right to seek asylum and there is a right under US law for individuals to seek asylum here in the United States that is 100% legal. And if you come and you stop at the port of entry, that means at the border, and you're like, hey, I'm here, and I want to seek asylum, every single person has that right. And in fact, US law provides that even if you enter the country unlawfully, you 100% have a right to seek asylum. Asylum is not limited to folks who stop at the port of entry asking for permission to come in. Everyone has that right um, if you are afraid to go back to your home country. 
And if you express a fear, US law requires that you cannot be deported unless you've had a credible fear interview with an asylum officer. Yes, Barry. Who are the asylum officers? When I come to the border and say I want asylum, who do I talk to? What is the training of that person? Or do you do it on a court of system? How does that happen? Great question. So Barry asked who are asylum officers and kind of what happens when I get to the border. So I'm going to answer your question in a minute because we're going to talk in the next slides about what exactly happens at the border. And if I don't answer it then, please remind me. So what happens when you come to the border? U.S. officials must advise you of your right to seek asylum in the United States. You don't have to know about it. And they are specifically supposed to ask you if you have a fear of going back to your country of origin. This site is to the federal regulations that say you have to do that. And the, where it came from was actually, I don't know if folks remember from the 1980s, a sanctuary movement. There was this huge issue. We had all these El Salvadoran and Guatemalan and other asylum people coming to the border and they weren't being asked this. Nothing was happening and they're being turned away despite the fact that we all knew there was civil war in their countries. They're being turned away because apparently they weren't seeking asylum. So they sued and we got this process in place which is really two forms. The first is called the form I-867A. And this is an advisal form. It has on here four paragraphs that every single person that stops at the border is supposed to be read. So the first paragraph just says, I'm a Border Patrol officer, I'm gonna take a sworn statement. But before that, I need to explain to you your rights. And the first one says that uh, you appear to be not be admissible, meaning it appears that you're not entitled to be in the United States. Yes. It is not. There is a requirement that it's supposed to be interpreted to you in Spanish or in whatever language you speak, but we're going to talk about some of those issues in just a minute. Um, but it is not a requirement this be translated, written out in Spanish or any other language. So the second paragraph says you might be admiss inadmissible and if you are deported you can't come back for five years. Then paragraphs three and four get more interesting and are more um, pertinent. So it says this may be your only opportunity to present information to me and the Department of Homeland Security to make a decision. It's very important that you tell the truth. If you lie or give misinformation, you may be subject to criminal or civil penalties or barred from receiving immigration benefits or relief now or in the future. Except as I will explain to you, you are not entitled to a hearing or review. U.S. law provides protection to certain persons who face persecution, harm or torture upon return to their home country. If you fear or have a concern about being removed from the United States, or being sent home, you should tell me so during the interview because you may not have another chance. You will have the opportunity to speak privately and confidentially to another officer about your fear or concern. That officer will determine if you should remain in the United States and not be removed because of that fear. Until a decision is reached in your case, you will remain in the custody of the Department of Homeland Security. There's a requirement that this be read to every single person. And the person reading this is Customs and Border Patrol officers. And they are the ones who do this initial interview. So there is this incredible study that was done by the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. It is a commission created by Congress of the United States. They did their first study in 2005, and then I believe they did updates in 2012 and 2016. This is one of the links. And so they found that C they observed these both by video and in person. And they found that CBP officers were not reading these paragraphs. They weren't reading paragraph three about you must because this is your only opportunity to give you information and then they weren't reading paragraph four about asylum and your rights. And they found that if they did read paragraph three, it was three times more likely, sorry, four times more likely that individuals would be referred to have that credible fear interview which they have the right to have. Similarly, if they were read paragraph four which specifically talks about asylum, they were seven times more likely to be referred. Um, and so this is a power that procedures can sometimes have. I'm not convinced they're sufficient because as you probably heard me read this, you're probably wondering what do some of these words mean. And for individuals who have limited education and they're being like translated some of these words into Spanish or indigenous languages where there is no equivalent, it's unclear that they're properly understanding what their rights are anyways. But we at least know that the statistics show that if you are read it, you're more likely to have, be able to exercise your rights. Yes. Yeah. So do they have to report this or is this like off the cuff? 
So uh, there are no, um, yes, sorry, is there a requirement that they record um, these interactions with individuals? So to my knowledge, CBP has no requirement and does not use body cameras. I do know, like most government facilities, there are security cameras everywhere, but it is, I, to my knowledge, these interviews are not necessarily being recorded, which is different from it being videoed, right? So what I do know is when this, um, the US Commission on International Religious Freedom went, they were able to observe in person certain interviews and then they did through um, see videos of certain interviews. I don't know if those videos were just taken for the purposes of their study or if they happen all the time. I will let you know in my practice, I've never been able to see one of these videos ever. Uh, so I'm not convinced that they exist. You also asked about people being told, uh, turned away because it's full. That's 100% happening and that's what I was talking about with metering. People are going to the front and they're being told, no, we're full, we're not taking people. So there is a huge line and there are organizations at the board are trying to maintain that line. Um, but you see folks getting frustrated and I think it was a few weeks ago, there was this terrible story about a father and a daughter, right, who died in um, the Rio Grande. And that's exactly what happened to them. They were metered, they were put in this line and they were there for weeks and they felt like they couldn't wait any longer so they crossed. There is a question in the back. Yeah, so his question was, is there any oversight or is there someone watching? So I'd say one, I think this commission does have the ability to do these updates and that's why they do have greater access than most folks. This study, it was like so illuminating for so many of us. The other um, option that individuals have is they can complete a complaint with the OCRLC, the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties of the Department of Homeland Security. We have assisted people to do that. KBI has assisted people to do that. I don't think we've ever really gotten any response. It is unclear uh, what happens with that, but there is still value in making it because then you have third party organizations that do Freedom of Information Act requests and they get copies of all of these and then they're writing reports about it. Um, and so I don't know that there is a very good government oversight. The one agency I'm aware of is the Office of the Inspector General um, and they do do some reports as well. Um, great. So other um, things that happen when you seek asylum is they're also supposed to ask you very specific questions. So they read you their advisals, they say, can I ask you questions? You say yes or no. And then they're supposed to ask you specific questions about having um, a fear of return. And this is a form I-867-B. And it looks like this, and these are the four questions. The first is, why did you leave your home country or country of last residence? Do you have any fear or concern about being returned to your home country or being removed from the United States? Would you be harmed if you are returned to your home country or country of last residence? Do you have any questions or is there anything else you would like to add? They're supposed to ask these questions to every single person. But um, in, again, the same report by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, um, they found that these questions weren't always asked or not all of them. And then they also found, of course, it was correlated with the number of people who were referred or had the opportunity to have an interview with an asylum officer. So when the fear, none of the fear questions were asked, only 5.3% of folks were referred actually to an asylum officer. When at least one question was asked, 8.6% and when both 18, yes. Correct. 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 And not doing it. Correct. Oh, okay. Yes. And it's going to get worse, and I want to tell you. I just want to be clear what's happening. Yes. So our question was, you know, my tax dollars, they're supposed to read each of these questions, and they're not. Is that correct? And I said, yes. They are not following the rules that they agreed to in a settlement and are required under federal regulation. Jean. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, please. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a big reason I do this work, right, is that there is significant injustice out there and that's why I'm so glad you guys invited me because I think people really care and are actually shocked by the amount of ways in which the government is flouting its own rules. Uh, Jean.
Uh, they can and they should, but the only questions they are asked are these four. So you would hope that in response to one of these questions, the parent does say it. But again, these questions are very limited. It's not a full scope interview. And this, these are the only questions they're required to ask for you to get the bigger interview with the asylum officer. So you point out an exact issue, is that these questions aren't clear or necessary to individuals what they're supposed to say to get that asylum interview. And I don't mean that in coaching, right? Sometimes you say that people are like, oh, we're coaching you to give the answer. It's like, no, we're just letting you know what you need to say so you can exercise your right. Like, tell them you're afraid and why you're afraid. Yes? Great. She asked, is a fear of a gang being afraid of gangs a legitimate fear for the purposes of asylum, or do you need to be afraid of the government? And my answer to that is it's deeply complicated. For this stage, any fear of return is supposed to be important because CBP is not trained in asylum law. CBP does not get to make a decision if your fear is cognizable under the law. That is not CBP's job. CBP is only supposed to ask you if you are afraid. And if you are afraid for any reason, CBP is supposed to refer you to an asylum officer who then can make some of those determinations. It can also be domestic violence. Yes, in my opinion, gang based claims, domestic violence claims are all cognizable claims under asylum law, both for CBP and for asylum officers. And when you get to an immigration judge, whether or not you win is a separate question, but all of those claims should have a right to see an immigration judge. Yes. So I'm surprised that the percentages are so low, even with all the fear questions being asked. Correct. Great question, Marie. So here's one of the reasons. So it says, in nearly 15% of the cases observed, asylum seekers who expressed a fear of, ret expressed a fear of return but weren't referred. Additional 15% of cases. And even more troublingly, in nearly half of those cases, the files indicated that they'd never expressed fear. And we hear these stories from our clients all of the time, that they have told Customs and Border Patrol that they were afraid and they didn't listen to them, and then they get deported, and then they re-enter, or they come again, um, and then they try to seek asylum again. Yes? Okay. This seems like a great opportunity for a batch of California citizens. I mean, you've got bureaucrats that are totally not doing their job, violating people's rights, that are totally under California citizens. I, I, I mean, I, they, the obvious guy should be like, you should be seeing your name being reviewed, I'm with you on that. Keep it to questions. So That's okay. I'm sorry, what's your name? My name is Athena. Athena. Thank you for your comments. I do appreciate them. I am not, Athena was asking why aren't these individuals being sued under Title 48 or um, other actions being, Title 42, sorry, other actions being taken. Well, one, as you can see, I don't know what Title 42 is, uh, but insofar as you know what Title 42 is or other folks do and believe that there is legal action to be taking, I'd love to talk to you and put you in contact with our advocacy folks. This is one area where we really are trying to push more um, issues, both locally and nationally. Barry was asking here, why aren't individuals being fired? Well, I'll tell you one big reason is that CBP is completely understaffed. They are constantly trying to hire. Um, and so when you're, when you're in a world, I think, where you so desperately need people, what happens? You keep people that aren't great. Two, I think Customs and Border Patrol doesn't necessarily believe that they need to follow all these rules. And attitudes that I have seen um, speaking to people that they don't believe people have critical claims, that they're just coming, they're lying so that they can get into the United States. Um, I personally don't believe that. And it gets worse with some of these regulations because they're supposed to review your entire statement with you before you sign it. 
but in only 28.2% of the cases was your statement actually reviewed before you and confirmed before you were forced to sign it. And why this is particularly terrible is these two forms, the IA67A and IA67B, let's say you eventually do get referred for asylum and then you do get um, in front of an immigration judge. These two forms are constantly used to impugn our client's credibility, which is everything in an asylum case. So if for one of the questions they answered, I came to the United States to work, which we see that all of the time, which ones my clients deny or they're like, too, yeah, I'm afraid, but I need to work too because I have three kids are constantly used by judges to be like, oh, you're not actually afraid. If you were afraid, you would have said something different. Um, and so we are constantly submitting to courts or talking to courts about the inaccuracy of these documents. And they just don't believe us, despite the fact that all of these statistics are from a commission created by Congress itself to investigate this issue. Um, and so it's a real problem that's rampant in all levels uh, through the system. Yes. Oh, interesting. So you made a comment that says title immigration law is exempt from Title 42. Again, I have no idea. Uh, so for other lawyers here, please research. Um, but there are organizations trying to bring different suits against CBP for different reasons. So one um, is the ACLU. They have a big suit about the hileras. I don't know if folks have heard about hileras, but they means like icebox in Spanish. Um, but they are these border patrol um, stations where you're seeing everyone held in cages and they're freezing. Um, and so AS ACLU has brought a lawsuit against CBP as well here in Arizona uh, for the conditions in those. And I will note that that lawsuit was brought under the Obama administration. So while the, the use and everything has gotten much more extreme under the Trump administration, it did not start here. And I guess the only one good thing I have to say about the Trump administration is it's gotten so bad that people are finally really paying attention. Yes. I don't know anything specific about that, but I, um, I know that the United States um, border policies have been um, concerns for international courts and commissions for a long time. Um, when I was in law school, I did a, we did a, had a hearing before the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Um, but I think as probably many of you know, the United States doesn't really believe that it is bound necessarily by these organizations. So I think it's amazing. I think we should still do that work. I'm not convinced it's going to create um, actual change on the ground. Great, so kind of just talking about the process and where we're going and so I can finally get to really Barry's question of who are these asylum officers. So I just want to be clear about where folks go and what agencies are touching them. So we talked about when you're right here at the border, it's Customs and Border Patrol. And they are part of the executive branch agency, the Department of Homeland Security. And then we have adults, so then they pass through the border Let's say they have been referred for an asylum interview. That interview doesn't happen at the border. That interview only happens once where they're detained. Does anyone know in whose custody they are detained? ICE. ICE. ICE, exactly. So Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and that is still the Department of Human Se uh, Security, but a different part. Then we have unaccompanied minors. Does anyone know in whose custody they are detained? Folks think it is ICE, but actually the law requires that they cannot, generally unaccompanied minors cannot be held in ICE custody, aside from uh, the temporary um, 72 hours, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Health and Human Services. Health and Human Services, perfect. The Department of Health and Human <coughs> Services, specifically the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, it is separate. And there is this case that's being talked about, about a lot in the news right now. It's called the Flores Settlement which says that unaccompanied minors are not, sorry, all minors are not allowed to be in CBB custody for longer than 72 hours. All minors are entitled to be in the least restrictive setting possible. And so when we talk about folks being released en masse, it is because of this 72 hour rule. CBP is not supposed to hold any minor for more than 72 hours. So if there is not bed space, that's what's resulting in um, large releases of families in major cities. Um, because there is no bed space. But they are violating this all of the time. They're not being released within the three-day window. And then we have families, um, and they are also detained. When family detention happens, it is in ICE custody. So that is accompanying minors with um, uh, parents are held in um, ICE custody. And again, they're supposed to get there within 72 hours. 
Right now there isn't family detention bed space because we don't have that many family detention centers in the United States. Still too many in my opinion, but we have a lot fewer of them. And so that's why uh, families are being released um, a lot right now. Yes. Um, I read yesterday that they have a very odd definition of family. If you come with a parent as a family and they say we don't separate that, we don't do family separation, but if you come with an aunt or a grandparent or a cousin or maybe a brother, yeah, I don't know about that one, but the others are definitely not family separation and they do separation. So have you tried that out in your work as well? So one, Family separation, even of parents, is still happening. It happened under Obama, then there was a huge increase last summer, and it has now tapered off, but it is still happening. So I don't want to pretend it is not happening even with parents. But at least there are greater rights and protections for parents now, and that's a lot more in the public consciousness. But it is correct that all of the settlements and stuff that involve family separation did not involve individuals who came with grandparents, aunts, or other custodians, even if that person was the only parent that this child might have. Um, and so we see that all the time. We also see all the time that maybe at the border, mom and kids are let in on what's called parole, and then they detain dad. We see that all of the time, and it's for no reason, except for the fact that they can and they want to. Um, so as I mentioned before, immigration detention of asylum seekers is not mandatory absent <coughs> certain criminal convictions, and asylum seeking populations very rarely have any of the convictions that require mandatory detention. Instead, ICE, the Department of Homeland Security, can parole people. That means just release them on their own recognizance. Um, and usually all it requires is uh, proof of their identity um, and that they're not a flight risk. ICE can do this directly at the border, which is what we're seeing with lots of families right now and have historically seen, and that they just later on apply for asylum on their own or wait for a court date. ICE can also do this if they detain people and then have a credible fear interview. So I forgot, sorry, I was gonna mention that. So once you get detention, to detention, and if you're an adult, you get to meet with an asylum officer. The asylum officer is from US Citizenship and Immigration Services, which is also another agency within the Department of Homeland Security. US Citizenship and Immigration Services does these credible fear interviews. It is supposed to be an extremely low standard to just get you in. Really, the only people it should be weeding out are people who aren't even asking for asylum on any um, cognizable basis. So for instance, people who are just economic migrants should maybe be weeded out in that process. Um, or that's really the only one I can think of, like people who just say, I'm not afraid. But if you express any other fear, in my opinion, you should be let to go forward. Because issues under the law about like gangs and domestic violence are constantly changing. This administration has taken a very active uh, role in trying to change that. The Attorney General literally picked up a case, Jeff Sessions picked up a case so he could rewrite the law on this issue. Um, there's a really big effort to take, as a result, immigration courts out of the Department of Justice, another agency under the President, and make them separate Article I courts, like bankruptcy judges. That's like way too detailed of a legal issue. Um, but the problem is, is that these folks are, the immigration courts are not free of political control. Literally, the Attorney General can change law. Um, that's really problematic if you're thinking about a justice system. Um, so yeah, so detention is not required. They can parole them at the border after a credible fear interview or any time thereafter on proof of identity that an immigrant is not a flight risk. They can grant asylum seekers release on bond as well. And as far as minors, minors are required to be placed in the least restrictive setting. Um, and so especially if you're an unaccompanied minor, even if you are taken to a shelter with the Office of Refugee Resettlement, ORR, they should immediately be contacting family members to arrange for your release. And it's only if there is no viable sponsor or caretaker that you're supposed to remain in custody. <coughs> but bond hearings are a little bit different. So we were talking about, again, the courts. That's Executive Office of Immigration Review under the Department of Justice. Now this is where things get really wonky. The Department of Homeland Security can release anyone who's seeking asylum if they want to. It's under their sort of prosecutorial discretion. Immigration judges, however, are not so free. So what do folks think? If you walk up to the border and you stop right there and you say, hey, I want asylum, you come in, you pass your credible fear interview. What do you think? You get a bond hearing. You've done everything right. You followed all the laws. You get a bond hearing with the judge. So great, the, question, the answer is no. 
Then Barry asks, how long do you wait for one? Anyone have thoughts? Never. Currently, under INA 235B, it says that asylum seekers who stop at the port of entry, they're what are called arriving aliens, are never entitled to a bond hearing with a judge, no matter how long they have been in detention. Now, there was a change a few years ago with a case called Rodriguez v. Robbins, where it allowed everyone, no matter what, to get a bond hearing at six months when detention was defined as prolonged. That got sent all the way to the Supreme Court. It lost on sort of technical grounds and is now back at the district court level to try to argue it all out. So hopefully we'll still see it come back. Um, but this is a real um, issue. So what about folks you think seeking asylum, but they didn't stop at the border. They instead entered and they get caught somewhere near it. Now they've had their credible fear interview and they passed it. Did they get a bond hearing? It would make sense that they wouldn't, right? Because they entered unlawfully. Guess what? They do. <laughs> and so this is also like an interesting piece in the law where there are weird incentives. Under the law, if you entered unlawfully and you seek asylum for the exact same reasons, you are entitled to a bond hearing. So I get this question all the time, why don't folks come legally or why don't they follow all the rules? Well, this is one reason. People know about these rules. And so they know, hey, if I enter unlawfully, I might get a bond versus never getting a bond. Which one would you do? <laughs> yes. Okay, so, um, I'm sure it's not. Why, why, why do you want a bond? Thank you, because these are assumptions that I make. So thank you for asking that question. She asked, why would you need a bond hearing? What does that mean? Anyone have any ideas? Yes. Correct. So a bond hearing is the first time you're supposed to be able to meet an impartial arbiter, the immigration judge, that isn't the Department of Homeland Security that's trying to deport you, and you. And you're supposed to be able to present in front of that court, and if you prove two things, that you're not a flight risk and a danger to the community, you might be entitled to get out of detention. It's not usually released on your own recognizance. The statute says a minimum $1,500 bond. That's the minimum. Uh, but we see bonds much higher than that. Um, I didn't include those statistics in here, but I think the average bond right now is around like maybe six or seven thousand dollars, or maybe five or six thousand dollars nationally. We see uh, for an individual, correct? Uh, and we see much higher <coughs> bonds um, here in Arizona. What's so have to, to be able to get out? That is correct. And then if they finish their case, whether they win or lose, they can get that back. If they win, they get it back, and if they lose and they show up for their deportation, they can get it back. Thank yes. You. No, great question. So children are released without payment of bond. They're supposed to, under their requirements of the least restrictive setting, if they find a family member or some suitable person to care for them, they're released without payment of bond. Um, but adults are the folks that if they don't get parole from the Department of Homeland Security, which can release them without payment of anything, the judges um, can issue, put in place a bond. Um, so talking about why folks don't come legally or why all folks don't stop at the border, we've talked about two of the reasons. One, we talked about metering, right? That there are now these huge lines, people are being turned away. Two, we've talked about um, uh, this perverse incentive with bond, right? And people learn this, the coyotes know this, people at the border know this. And while we encourage everyone to enter lawfully because you can some, if you have prior deportations, if you enter unlawfully, you're no longer eligible for asylum. So we tell everyone to present. Um, but some folks who know it's their first time and they know they really can't just be in detention, um, uh, they do this um, as you know, a way to survive. Um, and so those are big reasons. And then the other um, issue I think of why folks still cross um, unlawfully is because you know, there's still I think some hope that maybe you won't get caught. I think it's pretty rare these days that you're not getting caught. But the reality is that asylum law is limited. Um, it was created in the aftermath of World War II, and you can only get asylum based on fear if you can show that the persecution or harm you suffered or will suffer is connected to certain five reasons. Do folks know those five reasons? Can they throw out some? Political opinion, religion. Sort of, that's not its own category, but falls into another one, yes. 
Health is not, but wouldn't it be great? It is not at all. Uh, not for asylum. I don't know if you are thinking of the migrant protection protocols, which say that you can't be sent back to Mexico if you have serious health concerns, but it is not a basis for asylum so whatsoever. Uh, yeah, so yeah. asylum generally is discrimination, against, uh, discrimination or persecution. Discrimination is not enough. Persecution against a particular group. But the law says we only recognize five types, basically. Uh, political opinion, religion, and then I'm going to call this particular group, it's called particular social group. Then we have um, race and nationality. Those are the five. But then you ask yourselves, well, what about all these gang claims? Where do they fall? It's not really fitting in there. So LGBTQ claims fall into this particular social group. We can understand that. But for instance, where does gender fall? It doesn't, and the courts have often rejected that gender itself within your own country being a particular social group, which makes no sense. It's obviously a social group, um, but they have these floodgate concerns, which they're not supposed to consider, but they're saying if we let this happen in one case, it's going to apply to all of them. Um, yes? Great point. Natural disasters don't count. So we are increasingly seeing, for example, effects of climate change, right? Climate change refugees are going to be a very real and are a very real thing. There is no basis for protection or asylum or any legal status in the United States on that basis. <laughs> I was like, what? Thank you. That excellent point. Uh, yes. Um, so I don't have the numbers on that because my guess is they never get past CBP. Oh, sorry. He said, how many people are coming to the United States seeking asylum or other protection based on climate? And I said, I have no idea on what those numbers are. My guess is they're not getting past CBP, or if they are somehow getting past CBP, the asylum officer under current law would be fully right to say no. Um, because the fact that your farm is no longer um, good because of a drought isn't a form of persecution. Um, it's just a real, oh, 10 minutes left. Thank you. Uh, so I should get moving along here a little bit. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, so thank you. Gangs are a really complicated one too, and this is where words can really matter. So we have claims from Africa from, let's say, people involved with Boko Haram or other organizations who've been labeled terrorist organizations. Those organizations are often doing very comparable things to gangs in Central America, but we do not call gangs in Central America terrorist organizations, and I think that's purposeful. Because asylum claims with terrorist organizations involved win. Gang claims are extremely difficult to win. And this is how I again think that like we are affecting our system by the way that we categorize things. Um, and so one, that is an issue, right? That our refusal to recognize really the role that gangs play. The way that those claims do win is usually if we can get an expert that can really talk about how gangs in that home country are controlling or are quasi de facto governments. Even those cases don't win when we have great experts. Really, judges should know this. The human rights courts all say this, but they somehow need a low income immigrant to also then pay hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars for an expert to present that testimony to still convince them. Um, so these are all problems of people have knowledge, they don't want to grant these cases. Um, and so it is extremely difficult. And so we see cases that have like really involved terrible gang violence. Um, that you just have to turn away. Similarly, extortion claims are the same. The law is very bad on them. On DV claims, we saw a lot of forward movement on this a few years ago, especially starting in 2014, I think is when a case really came out that says we can finally do this. But then um, Jeff Sessions in a case called Matter of AB really um, brought back these, um, these options. And so now people have to be more creative. So for instance, this witnesses against gangs have been found to be a particular social group. Some people try to take your gang um, claim and put it into a political opinion piece to try to win. Um, so we're trying to think of other creative arguments um, to give people protection for the same harm that they have suffered. Um, okay, so a few current trends um, to kind of uh, bring us to closer to the end. Um, so since 2000, before 2007, really the largest number of folks we were seeing were people from Mexico um, immigrating into the United States. So let me grab my notes because I have some exact numbers here. Um, okay, so in Mexico, according, these are all CBP statistics. In Mexico, according to them, the number of people that they picked up for unlawfully entering the country in 2007 was around 876,000. 
that number, of that number, 808,000 in 2007 were Mexican. So the overwhelming majority. According to their statistics from 2018, um, the total number of people that they've caught entering unlawfully is just 404,000. So we talk about a crisis, the numbers are way down of the number of people they're actually catching crossing unlawfully, about half, according to their own statistics. And of that, only 155,000 are from Mexico, so only a quarter, um, as compared to them being like over probably 90%, I haven't done the math, um, back in 2007. And instead, the numbers are way up for folks from um, Central America. So um, fiscal year 2018, 116,000 uh, folks were from Guatemala, 77,000 from Honduras, and 31,000 from El Salvador. Um, so those numbers have, are the ones that have really gone up. Um, and then the other really big thing is the difference in the types of groups that are coming to the border. In the uh, earlier 2000s, it was overwhelmingly single adults and generally single male adults. Um, and more recently, we've seen a huge climb in the number of family units and going a little bit further back, a huge um, increase in the number of unaccompanied minors. So these are the statistics for the Southwest border unit, which is California and Arizona down here at the border um, for apprehensions this year. And so you can see this is where they're um, on track to this is the total number of people who entered unlawfully just in the southwest border. So the numbers are way up. Um, so Trump's idea that doing these policies would be a deterrent are clearly not working. Um, and the numbers of family units are way up and they've been um, going up. So um, the total number of family units for fiscal year um, 2018 was 107,212 uh, for individuals that they caught um, without permission, and this year we already have 390,000. Like that's an insane number. Um, for fiscal year um, 2017, family units were just 75,622, and these are all CBP statistics. Um, and they are, Marie asked this question about like what's a family unit being defined as. This family unit definition, at least on the Southwest border, includes more than just parents and children. It includes any um, unit in which there is someone under 18 accompanied by a family member. This is not, I'm pretty sure this does not include Texas, but don't 100% take my word on that. Now that you say that, it might include Texas. It might include this whole border from Texas up to California. I can't remember, because yeah, these numbers would be crazy if it was just Arizona and California. Um, I'm not sure, I can check that on my phone in just a second. Um, and then they, these numbers also don't include individuals um, stopping at ports of entry. So the numbers of folks stopping at ports of entries are definitely um, lower but they are also um, increasing. So for fiscal year of this year, 2019, there's 92,000 some family units. Uh, sorry, 92,000 individuals who stopped at the port of entry of which 37,000 are family units. So families are also going there, but the numbers at the actual port of entries are lower. Um, and then I just wanna talk really quickly before closing about some of the costs of our enforcement. Um, and so this talks about ICE detention bed quotas. There are quotas about the number of beds that must be left open for ICE custody every single night. And no matter if there's a person there or not, we are paying for those beds. So there is an interest for ICE to have a person there if you're paying for it. Um, and this is a whole separate conversation about the expansion of like the use of private prisons for immigration detention, which I think is a real problem, but it's all related to this. So the average bed rate is $208 a night for adults, and this includes just single adults is a little less, and then family detention is a little more, so that's how they get to this number. Um, and then comparing this to alternatives to detention, which is just like ICE supervision in the community, which can include ankle monitors or visits to your home, et cetera, and that shows that that in fiscal year 2017 was just $5.89 $5 per person instead of the 208. So the difference is huge. When we talk about immigration, uh, immigration, the cost that we don't include, I feel like a lot of time are the cost that enforcement is costing us. Um, and I think we could really change the cost of immigration if we considered, um, you know, I understand that a lot of people don't want open borders, but you can have a system where people are not incarcerated without having open borders, where they are released into the community at a much lower rate, can go to their court hearings and go forward with the process. Number one reason people say it uh, are against alternatives of detention is like people don't show up for court but the statistics don't bear that out. So these are recent statistics from the recent wave of family um, unit immigration. 
and this is by track. They do this amazing collection of data that they use government sources usually to figure out. Um, and so one, they show that overall, um, more than 80% of everyone is coming to their initial hearing and attending all of their hearings, more than 80% who are released. Um, and what's crazy and interesting to me is if you, you look at the bottom line, that reaches nearly 100% if they have an attorney. And what that tells me is that a lot of times people aren't going because they don't understand the process. I have a perfect example. One of my clients, I'm going to call her Maria. She came here with her um, two minor, three minor children um, after her husband was murdered. Um, and then her daughter and two, her, her adult daughter and two of their kids also came about a month later. They came, they stopped at the border, they were released on the parole, they gave ICE all their information about where they were living. They had ICE check-ins, they went to every single one. But then they went to their one in the middle of last year and ICE is like, you were ordered deported, you didn't show up to court. They're like, what are you talking about? You never told us we had court. We never got anything that told us we had court. And it turned out what the problem was is that they were living in San Luis, Arizona and ICE asked for their address. They gave them their physical address where they were residing. Turns out in San Luis, Arizona, there is only PO boxes to receive mail. You cannot receive mail at your physical address. So they didn't show up, they got ordered removed, um, and luckily we were able to successfully reopen their cases. But these types of things happen all the time. Um, I've similarly had a case where a woman was stopped. They didn't file any of her documents with the court for more than two years. So of course, two years later, she was no longer living at the address that she had given to them and got no notice. So there are a lot of problems that are caused by the system itself, just by technical issues, and then of course there are huge barriers of language um, that come up when all of your notice and all of your documents are in English. And then of course there are real people who are very afraid um, and misunderstand the process. I meet so many clients who are like, oh, I went to my first court and they said I had to come back with an attorney or I'd be deported. I go to these courts, I hear the rights advisals, I know that's not what's being said, but that's being what's being understood. Um, and that, to me, tells me that we need to be explaining people's rights differently. And so people are like, well, if I don't have an attorney, there's no reason for me to go back. Um, and so that's another real problem. Um, and so partially selfishly, but also I think the statistics bear it out. I think really where we can support immigrants and really have a more system is by having um, attorneys. I think it will be more fair for everyone. And then just last, to kind of close out, and I'm happy to take um, any questions, is just to encourage people to get involved. If you have some money, please consider donating to the Florence Project or the Phoenix Legal Action Network that funds this work. Please consider giving your time to either one of those organizations. There's also local organizations that do amazing work. The Phoenix Restoration Project, I love them. They um, are doing like hospitality and services for folks that get released from detention. They're at the bus station where ICE just drops them off, and they're supporting families who've been released for temporary housing and to help them, um, ca uh, oh my God, commute or get to travel, thank you, or travel, uh, to their final destination. And of course, as I'm sure you guys know, is please vote for candidates in your community who support the immigrant um, community. And then I think this last one is sometimes at least hard for me, even though I do this work, is to remember that wherever we are when we hear anti-immigrant rhetoric, to speak up, to talk about it, um, to talk against it. Because I do think some people just are ignorant or don't fully know, and we shouldn't assume that they're not compassionate just because they are speaking or using words that we don't approve of. So that is the end of my time. I think my time is about up too from Ron, but I see a couple questions. <laughs> I don't know if there's time. We, we have time for two questions? Two. OK. Uh, you, sir, with the beard, because I have not heard from you yet. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Okay, so the first question was, are any non-citizens eligible for like the medical assistance and social security, I think was your question, and the second one was about, are there organizations doing protests and things like that here in Arizona, yes. is that correct? So the first one, I really like this word and I think it's an important word you use, non-citizens, because um, the word immigrant applies to a whole swath of individuals. And so we often think that all immigrants are, um, are undocumented, but that's not true. There are a whole group of documented immigrants. And those individuals, depending on what type of status they have, may or may not be eligible for some of the services you have um, described. So for instance, individuals who actually win asylum, individuals that get like a U visa or VAWA, which are um, types of status based on being like victims of crime or victims of harm here in the United States, are often eligible uh, for public benefits. 
Green card holders, interestingly, at least for the first five years, lawful permanent residents are not. Instead, um, depending on what status you have, but if your family member petitioned for you, your family is required to support you at least for your first five years um, before you are eligible. And then for folks who work, if they have worked their required quarters or whatever to get their social security key and they have status, they can then get that at the end. Most of your clients are not eligible. That is correct. So I mostly only work with individuals who are undocumented. There are a few exceptions. I maybe have like two clients right now who are green card holders where the green card or their residence is in jeopardy where I support them, but overwhelming my, my clients have no status, correct? And then your other question is about are what organizations locally doing work? So we have a very vibrant immigrant rights community here that are led by immigrants in the community, both documented and otherwise. Where you feel comfortable might uh, depend on where your politics lie. I will say organizations doing really great work on the protest front are um, Puente Human Rights Movement and um, Lucha. And then you have other organizations that are doing a lot of work but are less protest oriented, I think. So you have Promise Arizona. They do a lot of work with the immigrant community about educating them about their rights, doing naturalizations and all that kind of stuff. You have ADAC, the Arizona Dream Act Coalition that works with a lot of dreamers. You have Aliento, which provides incredible services to, for mixed status families to help them deal with like the trauma and fear through arts and other activities that come with like deportation and the immigration system. You have organizations directed just for LGBT migrant community, Transco Pueblo, that does about both a lot of activism on the immigrant rights side um, and on the LGBT side. So there are lots, I encourage you to connect it if you want for information, I'm happy to um, provide it at the end. And I think you said I had number one Last question. Uh, yes, the woman sitting next to Jean right there, I'm sorry. And I'm happy to answer questions afterwards too, so don't feel free, feel free to come up, yes. Yes, you, right, yes, yes. Um, so, Phoenix Restoration Project is, an, so she's asking where she can donate kids' clothing and other items. Phoenix Restoration Project is great as they're providing services to families being released. Um, I don't know that any of the so-called shelters actually accept donations either here in Phoenix or in Tucson. The, the, uh, but there are a couple programs that work with unaccompanied minors. So Catholic Charities or Catholic Social Services, I forget the exact, and Lutheran Immigrant Refugee Services works with unaccompanied minors, but they're more generally teens. Um, but the Florence Project also accepts clothing donations, especially um, for kids, especially in the time that, um, that we were dealing with family separation last year, or even now as we work with families who've been released, we use those donations and are able to provide it for them, especially um, for new and young moms who are struggling. So thank I think Ron has said that's my time. That, again, that is time. <laughs> thank you and feel free to come up to me at the end. <laughs> We have a tradition here to mug our speakers. Yes, So thank, thank you. you very much, Reka, for coming out. I really enjoyed the discussion, and I'm sure we all did. One more round of applause for Reka.